This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Welcome to the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. In these times, we recognize the responsibility of a great university to seek to apply new learning to the world's most intractable problems. The work of today's speaker, Professor Gary Fields, exemplifies this kind of effort. Dr. Fields is Associate Professor in the Department of Communication here at UC San Diego. Um, his research focuses on landscape and conflict in historical perspective, with special emphasis on the Palestinian landscape. He earned the PhD in City and Regional Planning at the University of California, Berkeley, and his work has appeared in the International Journal of Middle East Studies, the Journal of Historical Sociology, the Arab World Geographer, and other publications. His talk today, as you see, is titled Lord of the Landscape, Israeli Settlement as Catalysts of Conflict and Obstacles to Peace. Please join me in welcoming Professor Fields. And I'd like to begin roughly two years ago with the now well-known and celebrated speech of President Barack Obama uh, about six months after he came into office, the, what's what we now call the Cairo speech, in which pr President Obama outlined a new vision for the Middle East. And among the comments that he made was one very succinct set of comments about the problem of Israeli settlements in occupied Palestine. And this is what he had to say. The United States does not accept the legitimacy, note the word legitimacy, of continued Israeli settlements. This construction violates previous agreements and undermines efforts to achieve peace. It's time for these settlements to stop. Uh, by the fall of that year, President Obama was even more emphatic in stressing to the Israeli leadership that the conditions for peace required the state of Israel to change its, its settlement uh, project in the West Bank. But as we now know, most of, or actually I think pretty much all of President Obama's remarks went unheeded, and not really, uh, not really much has changed since the Cairo speech. Now, uh, I'd like to go into why President Obama's remarks sort of provide us with a foundation for understanding this very, very difficult problem. And what the argument I'd like to make today is actually consists of three points. First of all, I, I make a point about the nature of the Israeli conflict. And what I suggest is that this is a conflict of competing narratives about rights to land. It's not a clash of civilizations. It's not a religious conflict. It's not a conflict about anti-Semitism, although I will say that the conflict contains elements of all of these things. But it is fundamentally, fundamentally about two competing visions about who rightfully belongs to this territory. Secondly, the two sides in this conflict are vastly unequal. And Israel, because of its superior power, because of certain events that transpired, has been able to shape the landscape and to implement its vision of the way it sees it belonging to the land. And finally, and perhaps the most important point, is I suggest that Israeli settlements are the primary enabler for realizing this vision of the landscape 
and at the same time, they constitute the most serious and intractable impediment to an agreement for peace. So in order to, uh, in, in order to argue this uh, set of, of points, what I want to do first is I want to locate us in, in some historical context. Now, there's many ways that we, could, uh, that we could begin this story. We could begin it in the, uh, well, actually, we could, we could probably begin it in, in biblical times if we wanted to do that. Uh, we could perhaps begin it at the beginning of Zionism in the, uh, or modern Zionism in the late 19th century. We might even be tempted to begin it in what's referred to, or what my colleague Gershon ref uh, Shafir refers to as the second Aliyah, the second wave of Jewish immigration to Palestine beginning in 1904. But I prefer to locate the origins of what we're going to discuss today in the outcome of the 1948 war, uh, what the Israelis call the War of Independence, what Palestinians refer to as the Nakba. Now, as, as we know what, what happened, and, and we, we, we don't really have time to get into the historical uh, idiosyncrasies of the debates around this particular set of events, but what we do know, what we do know for certain is that as a result of what transpired in 1948, Roughly 750,000 Palestinians migrated from what is now the uh, borders of Israel. They either fled or they were expelled, uh, one of the two. And they were, both of these things were intimately connected. Uh, it, the, the word expelled used to be somewhat contentious, but now it's, it's no longer really debated in the aftermath of the research of Benny Morris and other uh, histori what, what are referred to as new historians in Israel. Uh, this and even uh, the former uh, Israeli foreign minister Shlomo Ben-Ami has, has used this term in his book Scars of War, Wounds of Peace to describe the events of 1948. What was especially critical though about what transpired from this migration, whether we want to call it fleeing or expulsion, is that a large swath of Palestinian property and territory was abandoned as a result of this. Uh, roughly, an estimated four, four to 500 cities were abandoned, uh, along with the property that was left over by the 750,000 people, who became, many of them who became refugees in the outlying area. So the... Uh, so, uh, as, as I said, there's the, the well, I sort of preface this by the fact that there, there's obviously going to be some contentious aspects of this, but this is, this is if, if we think this is contentious, well, we, we have more yet to come. So uh, it should be a fun afternoon. Uh, but in any case, uh, the, what what we do know is that there was a large number of abandoned Palestinian towns and uh, uh, abandoned Palestinian property that posed a dilemma for the newly, um, uh, the newly consecrated Jewish state of Israel. That is, what to do with this abandoned property. And what, uh, what the new state of Israel decided to do with this occur actually occurs in four phases. And the, but the idea, the basic idea was to create state land out of this abandoned property. And the way this was done was through a number of very intricate legal, uh, legal laws that, pro that an enabled property to, tran to essentially transfer from one group of former owners, Palestinians, to a new group of owners, the state, and then to be reallocated for Jewish settlement of this territory. So that the, what we see in this slide is actually the, the map of what, what this, uh, the new state of Israel looked like right after the, uh, the independence or Nakba, depending upon our perspective and choice of terms, right after this occurs in 1948. It was a, a vast frontier that lay open to the new state. And the way that the new state decided to uh, overcome this dilemma was indeed to use the uh, apparatus of the law 
to, to essentially dispossess those Palestinians who had owned this land and property, to take control of this land through a land development authority, to reallocate that land to groups of, Jewish, of new Jewish settlers, and to actually settle the territory. That is to re remake the landscape, which was once fundamentally and overwhelmingly Palestinian in its socioeconomic and cultural characteristics, to remake that landscape through settlement into a very different kind of landscape. And it, as we can see, the, the map on the left sort of, uh, which is a, a more or less schematic for this, and the map on the right, also a schematic, shows how this was essentially done. It was taking Palestinian towns and making new Jewish settlements out of them. Now, this process actually didn't happen overnight. It la as I said, it lasted, it took up roughly four phases. It lasted from roughly 1950, when the first set of laws was passed to, to uh, remake this territory, to 1960, when the process was essentially complete. Now, the other, uh, may, th now I, t I talked about 1948 being a watershed event in this process of settlement, because that was the way that the new Jewish state settled the territory that it was now in control of. But 1967, the, the, we have another watershed date in the history of this area when Israel emerged victorious over a uh, set of Arab, uh, a combined set of Arab armies from its neighbors. And many thought this, was, this victory was uh, sort of messianic. They, it, was, it was kind of a, a sign of, of, of the times for, for the Jewish community in Israel. And the dilemma, there was a dilemma that was posed to the uh, conquering armies of the state of Israel over the territories that it had won through this conflict. That is, these territories that it took over from, from Jordan, in the, the, the primary territories, Jordan, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip from Egypt. The dilemma of the 1967 victory essentially posed a, a very similar set of problems as 1948. That is what to do with this territory. There were a number of plans for what to do after the victory of 1967. And the one that really got the most attention was designed by a, an Israeli officer by the name of Yigal Alon. And it was called, predictably enough, the Alon Plan. It was formulated in July of 1967. Mm -hmm. And Yalon was somebody who had understood the first 20 or so odd years, or, or more than 20 odd years, maybe it goes back even further. But one of the things that he suggested is that we've never held territory without settling it. That has been the essential motor of development for the Jewish state. And the plan that he proposed for these areas consists, and you can see on the map here, and I, I I bring maps because I, I understood from my students that not all of us, not all of us are experts in the ge in ge first of all in geography and certainly the geography of this territory. I learned to my chagrin about what my, what my students might know, so I never try to make assumptions about what what an audience might know. So I think it's always helpful to look at these issues in terms of the cartography. But essentially, here is the state of Israel. Here's the uh, West Bank captured from Jordan, the Gaza Strip. And what the Alone Plan called for was settling most of what we now call the Jordan Valley, essentially creating a contiguous corridor through the middle of this territory, through Jerusalem, and essentially splitting into two the, uh, Pal the, the, the West Bank, where Palestinians would presumably uh, live. They would live in two areas, anchored in the north by Nablus and Ramallah, in the south by Bethlehem and Hebron. Now, needless to say, this, this uh, plan remained, it was never ratified, it was never officially acted on, but what we can say about the Alon plan is that it framed most of the subsequent discourses about what to do with this territory that Israel was now in control over. Pardon me, where is this? Oh, excuse me. 
it's, it's it, as I said, it's right in the middle, roughly. And the idea was uh, the, 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 the question, the, the question that uh, emerged from the audience, where is Jerusalem? It's right around here. And the idea was to create a contiguous corridor with the rest of Israel through Jerusalem and the, Jor and the Jordan Valley. Now, the, so the, the, again, the alone plan in also envisioned settling some, some, not all, but a vast tract of this uh, land now occupied by the state of Israel. That is these areas in the, the cross-hatching areas. It was envisioned by alone that these would be indeed areas of Jewish settlement. So that if we look at the map that emerged on the eve of, the, of, of the 1967 war, that is the map of Israel in 1966, we, we look at, and we look at uh, the alone plan, the idea was essentially to duplicate what had been done in the first roughly 20 years of Israel's existence. That is, make those areas that you, you see in this map, the cross-hatching, put black dots there. That is black dots of Jewish settlement. Now, there was, there was a problem in this plan, unfortunately, um, or fortunately, depending upon our perspective. There was a slight problem. And that, that slight problem was in, uh, in the guise of the uh, Fourth Geneva Convention, Article 49, which seemed to suggest that what the alone plan desired to do in the occupied territories was more or less illegal. And it, it says it pretty clear, it's, it, 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 especially the second clause. The occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territories it occupies. It, uh, it, it seems to be reasonably clear. Um, as we'll see in a minute, any, I don't think there's any element of the law that can't be contested, and this was indeed something that emerged as highly contested. But for the moment, it seemed like it was clear. And Israel was a signatory to the Geneva Convention, ratified it two years later in 1951. So it, it, it was bound by this protocol. In September, of 1967, that is roughly three or four months after the June victory, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs asked one of its lead legal counsels, a guy by the name of Theodore Marone, to prepare a memorandum in response to questions about the legality of settling the occupied territories. And Marone was a, uh, I, mean, I guess we, what we could say, at least in this mem memorandum, is he was kind of a laconic lawyer, like to put things pretty clear and pretty simple. Um, and it's, it, his conclusion is pretty unambiguous. I mean, he says, he says to his bosses in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he says, look, uh, whatever we think we want, might want to do, my opinion is that it's illegal. Uh, contravenes explicit provisions of the Fourth Geneva Convention. So, I mean, he's, he's actually said, what he says is, you know, you, you know this, th there's, a prob there's a legal problem here, but you do whatever you want. Um, it's, it's just interesting, I came across this recently, I didn't know about this, but on the 40-year anniversary of his legal opinion, he was, in, he was interviewed by Christian Amanpour about wh what he thought of his opinion 40 years earlier. And he basically was unequivocal. He said, look, uh, we were uh, justifying occupying, sending our own citizens into the occupied territories at that time. Uh, but there's no, there's really no legal grounds for it. And he was of the opinion that what he had said 40 years earlier uh, was still as true in, 19, in 2007 as it was in, in 1967. Uh, now, that didn't, despite his legal opinion, however, there were very strong political constituencies inside the state of Israel that wanted to settle this territory. Uh, Moshe Dayan, for instance, one of the uh, heroes of the 1967 campaign, said, well, look, uh, you know, we, it might be illegal, but 
uh, we, we've done things before that are, have been on the edge, and so I don't see any, really anything wrong with it, and I think we should do it. Uh, at, at the same time, Ariel Sharon, a couple of years later, had, who was a real visionary when it came to settling. I mean, I, I say visionary in, with, in all seriousness. I think Sharon was uh, a real sort of geographer's geopolit geopolitician. He really understood what we call the map and the basis of the map. And he, a couple years later, said, look, there's, there's an even more grandiose vision that we could implement here. And we could become essentially masters of the entire landscape of the West Bank if, if we play our cards right. Now both, I mean, Sharon and, and Diane were, uh, they, certainly they were uh, military uh, men, but they were, uh, and they were, I mean, Sharon later became part of the uh, Likud government, but they were what we would call old line politicians in the Israeli mold. That is, the, they were sort of in the tradition of labor Zionism, even though uh, Sharon would break with this. But there was another constituency that was uh, in the offing here, waiting in the wings, that, was, that would prove to be extremely formidable. And this was a constituency that had not been real a real powerful force in Israeli politics until after 1967. And this was the constituency of the uh, religious, the, the sort of uh, settler religious right, anchored by someone by the name of Daniela Weiss, who was instrumental in forming a, an organization called Gush Emunim. And there were, there were many groups, and they were sort of amalgams of certain groups, but Gush Emunim was the settler organization that emerged from the efforts of a number of, of uh, religiously oriented members of the Jewish community who believed that the biblical, the, 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 the biblical presence of Jews in what they called Judea and Samaria was not only a, a task but an obligation of Jews in, in, in terms of settling that area. Uh, and this, for, for these groups, the areas of the, of the hilltops, the mountaintops, the, uh, places like Hebron, from Hebron all the way up to Nablus or Shechem, depending upon our perspective. This was the real biblical uh, foundation of Jewish life in, in uh, biblical times. And they wanted to settle this area. Now, the, and, they di so, and they differed, actually, from uh, people like Sharon and actually the, the original Al Alon plan. The Alon plan did not call for Jewish settlement in what uh, members of Daniela Weiss's group were calling Judea and Samara, Samaria. Those areas were going to be reserved for Palestinians. But the, the people from Gush Emunim had their sights cast on what they considered to be the historical and biblical rights of Jews to that land. Now, in the early part of uh, after 1960, from 1967 to roughly 1978-79, the way that settlement was promoted in, the, uh, in this area was, or the way that, the, the, that land was secured, there was, a, uh, there was a, process, a procedure for this. And the procedure was fairly standard. The rationale for settling this area was security. That is, the new state of Israel believed that sending, setting up settlements in this area, sending its own citizens, was the foundation of securing the safety of the Jewish state. That was the rationale. And so that settlements, the, the uh, taking of land for settlements, was rationalized on the basis of security needs. So a, a, a large number of, or not a large number, but the first few settlements in Israel from 1967 to 1979, the land for those settlements was secured by military order. And there was a, there was a, a large number of Palestinians who lost their land in this process. But the overarching, the supposedly overarching needs for security was the uh, basis and rationale for this. 
Now, there was a court decision in 1979, however, that completely changed the whole trajectory of the settlement project. Uh, the judge in this case, Landau, I, I think his name was, the judge in this case, uh, and it was a case that was brought by a couple of Palestinians who had lost their land to uh, actually a, a, a group that they, they had lost their land in, one, in the uh, early stages of settlement construction to military order. And they brought a case saying that this was illegal, that this should not be the basis of the land confiscation, that security was not a a justifiable reason for dispossessing Palestinians of this land. There was another, all, all this time, by the way, the settlements were, all, were always called temporary. That was the basis, that was the legal term that was used to say that they were not actually uh, dispossessing Palestinians in this process of securing land, that these were temporary. And in this case, it was very interesting because the both the plaintiffs and or the Palestinian plaintiffs were actually supported by Jewish settlers. And the, here's the reason for this. Jewish settlers said, indeed, uh, security should not be the reason for setting up these settlements. The reason for setting up these settlements is so that we can settle and populate this land. So that they kind of agreed with the Palestinian plaintiffs in this particular case, and they also disagreed with the state arguments that settlements were temporary. They said, no way. We want to set up settlements that are permanent. So it was a kind of Pyrrhic victory, as they say, for Palestinians. But what it did, it, it was a, actually a watershed in the settlement movement, because it forced the state of Israel to, uh, so, to devise an alternative method for securing the land for its settlement projects. And let, I don't, I don't want to go into too many uh, legal intricacies about this, but let me just try and give you the rough overview of what this entailed. The, the law, in the, what the Israelis did when they uh, took over the West Bank and Gaza is that they retained much of the existing Ottoman, or they, they retained sort of an eclectic mix of the existing Ottoman, British, and Jordanian law that had been there. One of the laws, one of the key laws that had been in place during Ottoman times was something called the Ottoman Land Law of 1858, Article 78. And what that essentially did is that that gave title to Palestinians who cultivated a piece of land. Now, why did the Ottomans do this? They weren't uh, benevolent or generous. They, they did this because they wanted to tax. They wanted to give Palestinians official ownership because they wanted to get tax revenue from that land. So it was, it was not, nothing benign here about it. Uh, now, the Israelis, once they, came, they realized that they could no longer use military order to secure this, uh, the, the land for settlements, what they did is that they said, OK, we're going to use the same thing. but." We're going to turn the, the law on its head. We're not going to look for the presence of cultivation to secure or to, or to, to uh, verify ownership. We're going to look for the absence of cultivation to, f to find and locate what we call empty land. So uh, and this is, this is kind of interesting. The way they defined the absence of cultivation. They said, if a, if a piece of property is less than 50% cultivated, then it's not, then it's, it's empty. And as empty land, we are entitled to take that land. That is, to turn that land into state property, same, same, same as what they, they, they had been doing all along, reallocate it for Jewish settlement. Now, you can see this, I, I forget what the name of this town is, but there is uh, here. I'd like to draw your attention to this hilltop, uh, and we'll we'll see in a minute why that's so interesting and important. Uh, there's you know there's some olive trees here. There's some olive trees here. There's a couple more here. Uh, but Israeli surveyors would go out to these areas, and they would actually survey this. They'd say, okay, we've surveyed this area, and we've determined that this is about 38 percent 
uh, cultivated. Therefore, and I mean, it all depends on your baseline, of course, and it's, it's, it's a very uh, down-to-earth kind of thing. I mean, it's very, it's very you know, th this sort of harkens back to the to medieval times when English estate owners were, you know, they employed surveyors uh, on the English estates, and when the, uh, you know, when English peasants saw the surveyors, they knew what was about to happen to them, so they would, they would often uh, uh, beat up a, a surveyor. So it's, 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 there's an interesting, uh, interesting dialogue in, in a book by John Norden called the, the Surveyor's Dialogue. This is about the 16th century. But anyway, sur sur surveyors would come out and they would survey this area. And they would come to some conclusion about the extent of cultivation. Now, what, what, you know, you could, I mean, there's a number of different ways you could do this. But you, the, the idea was, the, the prime idea in this was that the state of Israel did not want to dispossess Palestinian pro private property owners of their land. So they had to find a legal mechanism for securing what they considered to be land that was not owned, land that was empty, unimproved. Same, same rationale as John Locke in the theory of property. And they used this, they, they, from 1979 on, this is the mechanism that they used to create state land in the West Bank. They used this inversion of the Ottoman, uh, Article 78 of the Ottoman land law to find what they, they said was empty land. And they actually turned about 40% of the West Bank into Israeli state land through this mechanism. And many of you, I mean, I can already tell that some of you are very familiar with this, to this topic, but some of you have probably traveled in the West Bank and you've seen s scenes like this. This is what the landscape has been transformed to. Th I mean, th this actually is a very typical Palestinian town, by the way. I didn't say anything about it, but, you know, the, the pattern of Palestinian urbanization al almost invariably always looked like this. It was, it's very rare, very rare to see a Palestinian built up area, built, built up town on the top of a hilltop. The, the Palestinian town steps up to the hilltop and they leave the hilltop basically for either for, for cultivation, for grazing, but it's, it's almost never uh, taken up through uh, building and construction. Now the Israelis said, okay, the tops of those hill, they, they used this to secure the tops of hilltops as the empty land for settlements. So what, what you can see is this very typical scene. I mean, it's not, it's not typical. Ariel is a very large settlement, so it's not tip, typical in that sense. But the pattern, the pattern of settlement was very similar to this. That would be a Palestinian town down at the bottom of the hill, in this case, Marda. The Israelis taking control of the top of that uh, town or the top of that hill, and building a settlement there. Now, in this case, it's a, it's a little bit mo uh, more dicey because you can see here, all, you, you can actually kind of get a sense. This is all, in, in right up, this is all cultivated olive trees. And they, those olive trees actually were cultivated all the way to the top of the hill. In this case, they, the, uh, they took it by force because some of, the, some of the subtleties of the law were often disregarded. Um, and, and, you know, I went and interviewed the mayor a couple of years ago, and I asked him, you know, about this, and he said, look, we didn't take any land from anybody in building this. It was empty. It was an empty hilltop. And some of us might think, well, it's, that seems reasonable enough. And then he made an interesting comment to me, uh, because we, we were looking out from his house, and he says, look at the hilltops around here. Look, there's nothing on them. There's, they're, they're empty. We've really done something here. Now, at the same time, if you go to that town below, that is down here in the foreground, and you ask some of those residents what transpired, well, they, they have a slightly different story to tell. Uh, in this case, uh, Mohammed Ahmed Ibda, and I've interviewed about 80 of these Palestinian farmers. I mean, they all, they, they, they tell very similar stories about what's transpired. And this guy lost many, many, many olive trees in the building of, of Ariel. Uh, and so there's, there, again, this is kind of a, a sign of these competing narratives, these, these different ways of looking at who rightfully belongs on the land. Um, so this guy, I mean, he, and, you know, I, I mean, he was, when, he, when I interviewed him, he was pretty unhappy about the whole thing, as you might expect. 
After about 20 years, from 1979 to roughly 1999, the whole landscape of the West Bank and Gaza began to change dramatically as a result of this mechanism that I described for settling this area. This map is, actually this is a map of, of the settlements in 1999, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's good enough because the story, it, it, this, it's basically the same today. The footprint, the, the footprint of these settlements is different, but the, the, it, it's basically the same today as it was in 1999. And this gives you an idea, an idea of the extent to which this project of settlement has changed dramatically, changed the character of the West Bank, West Bank and Gaza landscape. Now, I, I just want to re revisit. In 1966, we can see a very similar kind of story that emerged in the two areas, inside Israel and inside the occupied territories. The, the project of settlement has been an enduring one in terms of, of uh, Israel and its presence in this, in this land. Now, I just want to make some brief comments about Gaza because uh, we, don't, we don't have, as many of you know, we don't have settlements in Gaza any longer. They were pulled out in 2005. There were about 7,800 settlers at that time. Some of you might know the story about that. But Gaza is, a, is an interesting case because it, it, the reason I've, I'm going to bring it up briefly because it's going to uh, affect some things that I say later in the talk. But the main area of settlement in Gaza was the south coastal area. This was the Gush Katif block of settlements. There were, there were a couple more, but this was really the main concentration. Now, in Gaza, there aren't hilltops. There are no hilltops. So uh, <coughs> where, where do you settle? Well, the, they decided to settle on the beaches. And the, uh, the beaches, well, of course, is prime. <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't, I guess, but the beaches, of course, are prime real estate. And you can see from the, this uh, rooftop shot that I took from the uh, town of Rafa, you can sort of see those red roofs in the background on, on the beach. Uh, this is what they look like a little bit more close up. These, these I took, I was actually in Gaza in 2005 during the actual disengagement and saw some of that going on right there. They, they were actually starting to dismantle them. But these, you know, these were heavily fortified bunkers, basically. Uh, the, many people from Rafa, by the way, they, because they took that, and there were, there were many Palestinians from Rafa who could not ever, ever go to the beach because the, they could not even uh, go up to Gaza to the beach because the checkpoint system would not uh, let them through. So they, years and years, they were unable to go to the beach. So this was the settlement project in Gaza. And one more thing about this, uh, these settlements in Gaza, it's true, they engendered enormous hostility on the part of Palestinians toward these settlers. I mean, there was, and the, uh, the contention of the Israelis that the settlers were in some danger and needed protection, it, it's true. I mean, they, they did. They needed protection because of the way they had been set up and the, the enormous antipathy and resentment that these settlements created in Gaza. And in 2005, they uh, eventually were evacuated. We can talk about that more in the questions. Uh, now, I want to make some comments about the settlement program in, in what's called Greater Jerusalem, because uh, now Greater Jerusalem is really, that was the original target of the Labor, uh, pol labor settlement policy in 1967. What they really wanted to do was not settle uh, those areas that I've just been describing that were essentially the project of Gush Emunim. They wanted to settle the areas in and around East Jerusalem to widen and enlarge Jerusalem. And, th and this they have done. They've actually done this. They've uh, extended the bound. The, the, Jerusalem was, they've extended the, they've annexed this area here. I don't know if, this used to be, they've annexed all of this into Jerusalem. And they've now reconceived of Jerusalem oops, yeah, as a huge kind of uh, Mumbai-like megalopolis that goes all the way to Jericho here. 
And all of these, they've been settling all this area. You can see the blues, the blue marks here, the, these blue settlements, these are all settlements in East Jerusalem. That, uh, uh, now this territory has been annexed, this territory is occupied, there's some uh, legal distinction between these two, but the idea was to create a unified Jewish capital of Jerusalem here. Uh, in doing this, this is what the settlement project looks like in this Jerusalem envelope. This is this happens to be, uh, this is now, the, the, the top is referred to as a neighborhood, the neighborhood of Gilo. Uh, the bottom is the uh, Palestinian town of Bet Jala, but essentially this area of, on top Gilo has been built on land that belonged to people here at the bottom. Uh, this is what it looks like uh, in Palestinian town of Nahlin here, uh, and facing it, Bitar Ali. You can, you, you know, you can actually see in the photographs, I think, the, if, if, if we're sort of interested in uh, urban culture, you can, you can sort of sense a very different kind of culture manifesting on the landscape. Two very different visions about the landscape itself that's embodied in, in this and in this, the, the uh, Israeli settlement on the top, the Palestinian town on the bottom. Now here's what the, pal the settlement population uh, looks like in terms of the uh, numbers. And you can see the, the, the main thing, there's two things to, that this uh, chart reveals to us. First of all, it shows un just unending growth in the settlement project. Now there's not, there's not a lot of new settlements, but most of these, I mean there's, actually there's just, there's very few, there's a couple, but not very many. That, that map I showed you in 1999 is pretty much the, the settlement map. There's a, there's a couple new ones and we can talk about things called outposts, but essentially the population increase is coming from expansions of the existing settlements. And it's, it's continuing unabated, there's no let up in this. But the other thing that's most interesting about this, I would like to draw your attention to, is if you look at 1972 and 77, you see that the, settle the settlements in East Jerusalem are far more numerous than what was occurring in the West Bank, WB. EJ, East Jerusalem, WB, West Bank. But after the Likud, of after the Likud victory in 77, what you see is you see enormous growth in those settlements in what the uh, Israeli settlers refer to as the Judea and Samaria area. That is the enormous growth in the West Bank settlements. And, right, and they eclipse East Jerusalem. Uh, right now there's, uh, there's over 300,000 settlers there, 200,000 in East Jerusalem, but half a million. Again, the legal what is the legality of these things? Well, there's, you know, b besides what I've already referred to in the uh, Geneva Convention, the UN Security Council did weigh in in 1979 and did say that these things have no legal validity. Now, Israel does have a legal position on these settlements that they're uh, very willing to defend. And the Israeli legal position consists of these I mean, it's, it's, it's more intricate than this, but I, I've distilled it into these five points. And that is, first of all, the, the, the Geneva Convention was only intended for World War II, and it was only intended to cover forcible transfers. That is, it was designed to, to, to mitigate those situations where people were forced to go someplace where they did not want to go. And the Israelis say that that's, there's no such thing as this happening in the West Bank. Uh, Israeli settlers are simply returning to areas prior to 1948, and some would claim that they are returning to areas of biblical settlement. Uh, the fourth point is a little bit, uh, th this requires a lengthy explanation that I'd rather avoid at this point, but basically the long and short of it is that there was no sovereign power in the West Bank. And therefore, if, because there was no sovereign power there, there is no absence of an agreement, a peace agreement. There's no absence or presence. There's none of that. 
So the, the idea that the, the, this, this just is inapplicable. And then the last one is a little bit funny because sometimes even on the Israeli foreign ministry website, you can at times see the words occupied territories. Even Ariel Sharon used that term toward the end of his life. He said, yeah, these territories are occupied. So I'm not certain what the, the Israelis actually gain by calling them disputed because there, there's, it's a little bit uh, uneven, let's put it that way. Now, I'm sorry, we need to conclude in about okay. five minutes. Five minutes, let's, let's do it. Um, all right, why does all this matter? Um, why, why does all, what, what, what's really at stake here? I mean, besides some of the legalities, what's at stake is that these, most of what's uh, at stake besides that is uh, there are things that are occurring on this landscape that I would call proximity conflict. That is, conflicts between the residents of these settlements and the Palestinian towns right adjacent to them. You know, I had a, I, I had a student just this past term who, uh, when I was giving a, a presentation similar to this, said, you know, why can't they just get along? <laughs> and uh, it's sort of reminiscent of Rodney King. And, and you know, I, 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 I did the same thing. I sort of laughed in the beginning, but it, you know, I think it is a good question. Uh, most of the, the questions like that often f uh, force us to really confront difficult issues. And I think the difficult issue here is the way, and, and I'm going to have to summarize this really quickly because our, our time is ticking, but the, the issue here is how these settlements were secured and the dispossession that occurred in, among people in, these, in the Palestinian excuse me, the Palestinian towns where that did occur. There's enormous hostility. Are the, and are, are these people insecure? Yeah, I think they are. They, they have uh, some reason to be because these people down at the bottom are not all that happy about what's happened. Uh, sometimes this, uh, and you, many of you have probably seen this. I mean, I saw this a couple of years ago with Mahmoud uh, Sabatin, a farmer from Husan, who's, who did lose land to the settlement in the background, Batar Elite, lost 20 dunams but still retains 20 dunams right next to this settlement. What happens to this guy is that almost on a daily basis, his olive trees are burned by settlers from, from the nearby settlement or, or vandalized. Uh, the expe the, and as I said, the main, one of the main uh, things going on in the settlements now is expansions. And I was witness to one of these. The, this settlement here, Zufin, uh, is right adjacent to this town, Jeyus. Most of Jeyus's farmland lies in this area here, and they have to go through a gate in the wall to get to it. Uh, when this expansion took place, the, I mean the, uh, and this is this is often the case, the land in the, adjacent to the settlement will be rezoned. It will be rezoned from agriculture to to housing. And so this land was rezoned, that, that is this land just to the, to the north right here was rezoned for housing. And about 117 olive trees were uprooted that belonged to this gentleman here. Uh, they warned him, they warned him that this, I mean you could say, oh, they warned him. And they told him that they, he needed to do something about his olive trees because he was a non-conforming use. Well, he's not, he didn't do anything and finally they, they were just uprooted. This uh, past spring, I happened to be in the Palestinian town of Borin. Up here is the settlement of Harbracha. And these two communities, I mean, in, in terms of trying to get along, this might be, we, we might be waiting for the Messiah before that happens. But the, the problem, what you can see here, what has happened is that there's a line here. And I'm not going to go into this, but there's there's a line. We, we can almost call it a, a line of control. I don't know if you can how cl clearly you can see that on the screen, but you can probably see it. Here are olive trees, here are grapes, and here is a winery. Now this area here actually used to belong to the farmer who owns these trees here, who lives in this town here. But these villagers decided to seize control of this uh, area, and they took out the olive trees, actually they burned the olive trees, and they set up grapes. And I think that this, uh, and th there's, there's really not much that these people can do about this. These people are heavily armed. These are some of the most violent settlers in all of the West Bank. Uh, 
it, it really shows the contrasting visions of what these two people are about. Why, uh, now, in order to protect these settlements, there's a vast uh, infrastructure of <coughs> checkpoints, mostly looking like this or like this. Uh, there's also a barrier. And the barrier, uh, indeed, th there's, there is some, uh, as I said, the people on the top of the hill do have some reason to be fearful of the people below because of the way that the land was secured for the settlement on top. Okay, so uh, these are the issues on the ground. I, what I wanted to do was give you a, a, a sort of sense of where, of how this uh, process evolved historically, the contentious issues on the ground. As you can see from the, from the, what, the map, the, the problem is where, the big problem here, we can get into the discussion from these settlements, is where is the Palestinian state going to come from? Thank you very much. Professor Fields, <clears throat> I know you're in the Department of Communication, and as such, you're an expert on what to leave in and what to omit when you give a talk or show slides. And that's what you've done today. You've, d you've omitted some of the reasons why certain conditions exist. I don't have too much of a quarrel with some of your observations here, but you're leaving out the four Arab invasions of Israel, you're leaving out the terrorist attacks, you're leaving out the rockets from Gaza, you're leaving out the failure of negotiations, you're leaving out all kinds of things. Now, I don't expect you to answer all those things, but what I do want to do is invite you to my talk on Monday at 1 o'clock, and you'll have a chance to ask a question or make a comment just as I am now. Thanks for that comment. Did you want to come in? Uh, I think I'll look forward to coming to the talk on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to, to speak. But I, 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 I want to know what, you know, when one discusses historical events, it depends on your starting point. It depends where you start. And you started in 1948. Mm -hmm. But events took place long, long before. In fact, in San Reno in 1921, the Congress was held and a decision was taken where the Arabs were allocated what is today Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. And land was put aside for the Jewish people, for a future homeland for the Jewish people where um, Jordan and Israel and the West Bank now stand. Britain was given the mandate over that area. Um, Britain went ahead and gave away 68% of the land allocated to the Jewish people, um, to the Hashemite kingdom, and to the Arabs. Yes, coming now. Can you explain to me why it is thought that it is illegal for the 32% of land that was allocated, that was left to the Jews, why is it illegal for any Jew to settle in that area, wherever it is? Now, which? Let me just clarify your question. Why is it illegal for Jews to settle in land that has been put aside by the League of Nations for the Jewish people <coughs> in 1922? Put aside for the Jewish people for a future homeland. Now a Jew comes along and settles in that land, anywhere in that land, and that's called illegal. <coughs> Could you explain that to me, please? Well, the uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what again what land you're speaking of, but we're talking about Israel, the West the Bank, and Gaza. The river, and I think the from the river to the sea. Okay. Sixty-eight percent is now Jordan. Yeah, but that's uh, what, and, what you're and, describing and what is that left, that's been what was left of the decision mm -hmm. of the uh, of the League of Nations was that the 32 percent from the river to the sea was land set aside by the League of Nations for a future homeland for the Jewish people. 
But that's so why is it illegal to settle there? It, it, it's very clear why it's illegal to settle there, because the, 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 what we're talking about is the conflict that the way it was resolved in 1948-1949, it set up the State of Israel, and it's the, the State of Israel had what it's the, the green line that was established, the armistice line, that was the State of Israel. Outside that, the, the State of Israel, that's land that does not belong to it. And the, that, that's, that's simply, I mean, it, 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 the international community, the Geneva Convention, all of these legal conventions have pretty much established the conditions for settlement in the West Bank and Gaza. I don't, I, I don't think there's, there might be, the United States, by the way, has not, has basically demurred on this issue of settlement in the West Bank. They say, they don't, they, they, I mean, Obama said it's not legitimate, but he, he didn't use the word illegal. But the United States generally says it's, it's not legal, it's not illegal. They tend to ignore it. But it's, look, it's, it's been, it, it's been tested. It's been tested by the Geneva Convention, in the Security Council, and in the International Court of Justice that these settlements are illegal. I don't know what more I can say about it. It's, it's, it's pretty clear. Uh, there's something called the spoils of war. After the Second World War, a lot of the allied nations took property which Germany had. Mm -hmm. um, and in some case, or Japan. And they've kept them all these years. Should they have gone back to Germany? Secondly, what about all the Jews who were expelled from all the Arab countries. There are hundreds of thousands of Jews in Iran, Iraq, or Egypt, all around there, who were expelled and had their property taken away. What about all those people? Well, I think, I mean, I th look, I don't think that anybody should be expelled from, any, from property or homes that belong to them. That's, it's, it's pretty simple. If they, if they, you know, if they've lost, they have, you know, they, in this case, I mean, I don't know enough about those particular cases that you're referring to, but in the case, the Palestinian case, it's pretty clear. UN resolutions give Palestinians the right to land and property or compensation. And, the, the, you know, the, the Geneva Convention has, is pretty explicit about spoils of war. It says that no country will... Uh, spoils of war is not a reason for securing land and property of another. It's, it's, just, it's just not legal. Your first assumption was that this is a, basically a land squabble. But it seems to me, if you read, uh, I read the translated Arabic, that it's not a land squabble. Um, Abbas refuses to accept Israel as a Jewish state. And the attitude seems to be that they it took 200 years to throw out the Crusaders, and that they're willing to do that. I don't think that, or I, or I think that there's a large percentage of Palestinians that refuse to accept any existence of Israel. So it's your, basically, I think it is basically a land swap. Well, if it isn't a land squabble, what is it then? It's a religious squabble. I think it has, like I said, I think it has elements of religious difference. But basically the conflict is over rights to land. That's, that's fundamentally what this is about. It's, about. it's about who belongs to this land and who is entitled to be on the land. And, and one group, look, one group, both groups have competing narratives about belonging to this landscape. And those competing narratives uh, th there's, there's a lot of contentiousness in those narratives. The, the fact of the matter is that one group has been able to assert its vision of its sense of belonging over the other. That's, that's, uh, but that, the basis of the conflict is that group being able to assert its power over the other group. That, th it's, it's about land. It's, a, it's, about, it's about getting your land back. Uh, what about Tel Aviv? Is that okay. Uh, uh, yes, uh, in response to what you say, what I'm about to say has a certain amount of redundancy. I apologize for that. I can't help it. But I think you have to go back to 1921. 
1921, you had the Brian Kellogg Law, as also called the Pact of Paris in 1921, which said that to take territory that didn't belong to you, you had, there was no dispute about it, mm -hmm. and to just take it for your own personal aggrandizement is illegal. Okay? okay. In words, like, uh, within what happened in 1945, they passed the Nuremberg Rules, which said that uh, the aggressor country that then went into another country and lost the war does not have the territorial rights. I mean, you can't have a war in the other country and if they want to take your land, say, hey, wait a minute, this is our land, you can't touch it. What happened in 1945 was that uh, Russia, as, as you will, they, they, they took part of Poland and also <coughs> took Eastern Germany, a big part of Eastern Germany, and made it and gave it to Poland. That was legal. They also did the same thing in the Sudetenland, which was occupied by Germans who were pro-Hitler. And they would give them 48 hours to get out, and that land was given to Czechoslovakia. In 1948, is Israel, when they had the partition, the UN said part of it was a Jewish state. It was one third of the territory. The other two thirds, by population, was an Arab state. The, hmm? Oh, I, no, it's going to take me 20, 20 minutes to go along. So I, I know, well, give it to somebody else. <laughs> Look, I, I just wanted to make, you know, the com I, by necessity, I've cut out a, a particular portion of this conflict for us to focus on, and that is the settlement issue, because I think it's really the most intractable and difficult issue that is the biggest impediment to peace. I, now, and I've tried to explain what some of the reasons why that's the case. Uh, a lot of a lot of you want to uh, ask me about a lot of different things, and I think I mean that's of course you, you want you can ask me anything you want, but I, I would ask that you consider the topic at hand, and maybe we could get a little bit more specific on the issue of settlements and the peace process. Okay. With, with the evident intransigence on both sides. Is there any chance of a, an evolution towards any settlement of this or evolution towards peace? And what do you see as the steps that'll take us there? Well, you've obviously <laughs> asked a, a very difficult question. I, the one person in, who I think has the most insight about this is the former deputy mayor of Jerusalem, a man by the name of Moran Ben Venisti. Uh, ben Venisti was interviewed on 60 Minutes, I think it was a little over a year ago, uh, by Bob Simon. Very good interview. And Simon, and I was going to play the clip, but it's, the, techni the technical stuff is too complicated now, so you'll have to just bear with my imitation. But Simon said, uh, I mean, Ben Venisti has been, has been uh, analyzing the settlements for decades. And Simon says, well, what do you think the chances of a two-state solution are? And Ben Venisti said, the chances of a two-state solution are nil. The geopolitical situation that has been created on the ground from the Israeli settlement project cannot be undone. And so the, what this uh, has posed for people like Ben Venisti is that what, it, and, and simply if you look at the map, some of the maps that I showed, it is very, very difficult to find in those maps what the so-called negotiators are discussing. They're discussing two states, but where is the, the Palestinian state? You have, you have two states that have become essentially fused into one contiguous territory. Fu fundamentally, that is the reality. I have I a mean, question my, for my, you, my, and I'd like your opinion on uh, Well, I'm not done with my answer. Oh, uh, like my, my, uh, what I'm about to say in response to the, the previous gentleman's question is that I don't think, I, I don't see these settlers being moved from their homes. I mean, the West Bank, th this is their home. It's been their home for decades. Uh, you, you know, getting rid of 7,000 people in Gaza, that was a big, pretty big conflagration. Try imagining 550 to 600,000 people. They, they're there. So what are you going to do? 
Well, I mean, I, this might not please some of you, but I think there's only one solution, and it, it's, it's, not, it's not the solution that you might be thinking of. I think the only solution, really, is a secular democratic state. That is, and the reason for that is what has happened on the ground, on the landscape, has made every other solution completely and utterly untenable. Uh, we, I'd like your opinion on something, but uh, before I ask, get your opinion, I'd like you to just comment because the Israelis did exactly what you're proposing. They abandoned the settlements in Gaza. How'd that work out for them? How'd that work out for anybody? Was there any, anything positive that came out of them abandoning the settlements in Gaza? If they abandoned the settlements in the West Bank and abandoned all of the Palestinian areas where settlements have been built and laid down their arms, the Israelis laid down their arms, would there be a Jewish state in your opinion? I know you don't want there to be a Jewish state, you want there to be a secular state, but that's not what's there and that's not what's going to be there because the Arabs will not live in a secular state. There is not a secular state in the Middle East. There is a Jewish state and there are Arab states. If there's going to be peace, which I don't think there's any chance of, it will have to be with a Jewish state as part of the landscape. But I'd like your comment. What do you think would happen if the Jews moved out of the West Bank as they moved out of Gaza? Well, if they did that, I think there would be a chance for a two-state solution. That, that I, I do think that's the best solution, by the way. But I don't, <laughs> short of, of removing or doing, or the settlers deciding that they would rather live in Israel, I don't see that happening. So, yeah, I mean, in answer to the last part of your question, if, if the Jewish settlers decided to pack up and abandon uh, what they call Judea and Samaria, and go in Isra go live in Israel. I yes, I think we would have the basis of a of a solution, but I don't. They installed rockets where the settlers were. Well, you know the situ the the problem in Gaza is really much more complicated than what you think. I mean the 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 problem in Gaza. Indeed, they pulled out the. Uh, 30,000 troops that were guarding the, the 7,000 settlers. But they, unfortunately, they did not pull uh, th all of the, the uh, control in and out of Gaza. The, the entire society of Gaza was still completely controlled and dependent upon Israel. It really, you know, when you, I'll give you one, one I'll give you two examples that may, might make this more concrete. When I went to Gaza in 2006, um, this was the second time I was going. I was there in 2005. How do you, how do you, how does one get into Gaza? Well, one gets into Gaza by permission of Israel. That that is not to me. I mean, I I don't know what kind of of uh, you know disengagement that represents. That's not disengagement. That's Israel maintaining control over the territory. Secondly, I had a student in Gaza an international relations student who uh, I had been working with uh, real closely since I went there for the first time. And this student had been accepted to do a master's degree in international relations at American University in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was all set to go, but he wasn't able to go because why? Because he could not get an exit permit out of Gaza. Why couldn't he get an exit permit out of Gaza? Because the Israeli government, the Israeli government, would not give him an exit permit to start his studies in Washington, D.C. That, I, I, I would submit to you, that, that's not disengagement. There was a whole host of other things, the fishing rights, I, I mean, the, the, every, the, all of the, the electricity, water, all of the basic infrastructure. This, this is a territory that's still under Israeli control. So. The idea of disengagement, I think we have to interrogate this a little more carefully before we make pronouncements about it. How does what you call uh, confiscation differ from what we have here, eminent domain, where 
in Los Angeles at the airport, they used eminent domain to eliminate, to, to purchase and eliminate one fourth of Westchester, the homes there. So how, what's the difference? Uh, security is the key thing that you talked about. That's an interesting question. Uh, we, we use eminent domain, and some of you who might be, plan I'm an ex-city ex planner actually. Um, eminent domain is used, in, especially in a lot of redevelopment contexts, uh, for economic development. And what it involves is the seizure of private property for public purpose. Uh, it does happen in this country that some private property is taken for public purposes. It, it, it does happen. Uh, the, the extent to which this happens, though, is relatively infrequent. To compare eminent domain in this country with what's going on there, though, I think are two very, very different kinds of, of uh, practices. Th their eminent domain, th this, is, this is not really eminent domain. I would have to say this is, this is, land, uh, this is land confiscation. It's very different. And it's land, it's, it's not, the public purpose here is very circumscribed. It's, it's very, there, there is a public purpose in these land uh, seizures. The public purpose is to house Israeli citizens. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that's a sufficient condition for uh, the seizure of land that's been, uh, that we see across the, the West Bank. There has to be some kind of public purpose for the other side as well, and, and for it to be equitable, and I, I just don't see this. So it, it's an interesting comparison, though. If the Israelis did decide to go back to their other borders, so there could be a two-country um, mm -hmm. situation, what would the Palestinians want to done with those settlements? Would they want them destroyed? Would they occupy them? I mean, well, what, what would happen to them? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think that if they're, I mean, again, this is all conjecture, but we, we can only uh, go on the, the, the Gaza example. Of, uh, but I, I think, I think most likely, the, certainly the religious buildings would probably be destroyed. Much of the housing would probably be destroyed. I mean, I, I, I don't see the Israelis just sort of abandoning them and saying, well, here, t take them over. And at, at the same time, I don't see the Palestinians wanting them. I think that you can see that the, the cultural visions of these, I mean, you look at a picture like this, the, 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 you can almost see the two different cultures embedded in these different views about how to develop the landscape. So I, I, I would see the Palestinians rebuilding from scratch. But you know, I think we're talking about something that's quite remote and not likely. And not, not to make you overly pessimistic about this, but I don't see this happening uh, in the near future. And you know, even if you listened to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech in the in the Congress, uh, when was it? Two months ago or so. The what, what he suggested there was is basically, uh, and, and and he got 29 standing ovations. What he was basically outlining is he said, look, we're going to continue to occupy this place. We're going to be in the Jordan Valley Valley for the foreseeable f future, and we're not going back to the 67 borders. And these, these congressmen applauded that. Do um, we have a question here? Yes, I have. Uh, well, just one minor comment. The Gaza would not be as restricted if they had not been sending missiles over into Israel day after day. But the other comment is, the, or a question, there's an awful lot of Arab land available. The whole Sinai Peninsula, which was given up by Israel, and Gaza, of course, was given up by Israel. Isn't there any other portions of Arabic land that the Palestinians could resort to? That's my. Well, I, the Sinai, I, I'm not sure. What, I mean, that does not belong to. That belongs to Egypt. So I, I'm not quite sure what. Israel first, and then it turned back to Egypt, and Egypt has a lot of land, so maybe they could give up a few uh, <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of land in the world, but why, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what you're... Or Jordan, which is about 65 percent 
Palestinian anyway. Plenty of places for the Palestinians to go. That's what I'm getting to. Why just this? Well, why can't they go back to their homes? I mean, that's the question. You know, they, they're entitled why to. Can't you, the Israeli or the Jews who were that's out that's the law. The law. Can't go back to their homes. I look like I said. I think that. Anybody, there, there shouldn't be any forced displacement anywhere. I'm against it. I'm against rockets in Gaza, just to, to go on the record. Yeah. We can't still have the microphone ask the questions or else the TV yeah. can't hear it. Um, two things regarding eminent domain, the United States Supreme Court did rule that besides public, it could be for private too. Uh, that was a ruling about two years ago. Even though I might disagree with it, uh, the Supreme Court did rule that way. Now, when you say Israel should, uh, uh, should be a secular state, are you saying then uh, all the occupied areas, they should also be given, uh, I have a follow-up to my question for this, uh, be given a equal voice in a vote? Is that the question? Yes. Then, yeah, basically, okay. basically, my my position is the same okay, as Tony Judge. Yeah, my one person, one vote. One one person, one vote. Right. With the population growing, with the Muslim population uh, of having so many children, and the Israelis aren't having that uh, type of uh, situation. On the contrary, that eventually that's not true. They'll become. That's why Israel has not annex that profit, uh, that territory to make them citizens mm -hmm. to give them a vote because they know in the future there would be more Muslims than Jews there. And what would happen then? Then when there are more Muslims than Jews in Israel, then you will have, the country will become a Muslim country under Muslim law. Well, I, I don't know that we can predict anything, but what I do know is that you, the, the idea of a state Base and whether it's the Jewish state or the Islamic Republic, I'm against. I, I think it's not a model for citizenship in the modern world. I think the model for citizenship in the modern world are secular democracies where people are equal. You make comparisons to a lot of other places in the world. For instance, in, if you want to go to Tibet, you have to get a, a visa from China. If you want a permission from China. In Croatia, if you want to go to the beach of even Herzegovina, you have to go which is two miles stretch. So Gaza was like that. But you mentioned also Arabs. Israeli citizens. Arabs. And there are many Arabs who are Israeli citizens. And there are model places within Israel where people have coexisted more recently. So do you think that yeah. one of the obstacles regarding these settlements is not so much from what we would call the Amcha, the regular people, but from, as we're seeing it all over the world, the fundamentalist idea of uh, the leadership saying, we do not recognize your right to exist, and therefore they will try to get even the populist view, the, the people, in, uh, uh, in this army, so to speak, or on this bandwagon. I think the gist of the question seemed to focus on the possibilities for cooperation between different groups of people. And indeed, that's, that's what I believe. I believe that those possibilities exist. I look at situations that, in 1985, for instance, looked pretty bleak uh, in South Africa. But, you know, the South Africans, I mean, that doesn't mean that that society doesn't have enormous difficulties and problems. But I think, I, I re really think that ultimately this is the only solution to solving the conflict in this, in that region. There's, there's, I just don't see any other, there, there's, there's a couple of options. There's, we could go another 45 years of occupation. Uh, we could try the two-state solution, which for reasons that I've tried to outline here, and uh, people such as Moran Benvenisti have suggested is untenable. Or we could say, okay, the model for uh, modern citizenship seems to be uh, one of secular democracies and cooperation. We could go that route. I, I think that's actually the only, I, I mean, two years ago, I didn't believe this. I, I was firmly in the camp of two states. But I think, I, I don't see it happening. I can't see it happening. And I think the only way that there's a, going to be a solution is, is actually, I'll, I'll paraphrase my student. I, I mean, I think people are going to have to, to get along, and there's going to have to be some, a different kind of 
a political entity there, and I call it a secular democracy. You can call it whatever you want, okay, but I think that's the only solution. Time for only one more question. Professor, there seems to be a lot of concern uh, among people that I've talked to that this issue is not being handled in a fair and balanced way as far as UCSD is concerned. Could you explain to us how the university handles this as far as, in some circles, you're considered a partisan for uh, one side. How is the other side treated at the, uh, at the university? Well, I, I, my, the side that I try to, uh, I mean, at least, I, I don't identify with either side. The side that I identify with is, is the side of education. Uh, that's the, the goal here. It's, it's, it's to share the best information about this issue. And it's, it's the only way we can proceed. I don't, I, I don't really know how the other side is treated. I'm, I, I, I don't know how I can answer that. If, if in, indeed you're identifying me with one side, I don't know how I could respond to your question about the so-called other side. I mean, our job as educators is, is to provide students with information so that they can make decisions about contentious issues like this. And, you know, I, I have no stake, for instance, in whatever, whatever position my students want to take on this issue or any number of different issues that I teach about. That's their business, but they have to know what the arguments are, the various arguments on both sides, so that they can make an informed and enlightened decision about contentious issues in the world. That's, the only, that's what we do at the university. The university, you know, this is not, people think that the university is a metaphor for Fox News, that there's something here that we call fair and balanced. But you know, that's not what a university is about. A university is about the sharing and pondering of arguments about the world. That's how, we, that's how we gain knowledge about what's around us. We don't, we don't gain knowledge about the world through some mythical uh, thing from Bill O'Reilly about something called fair and balanced. We argue about what, the, what we think the world is. Arguments are, by definition, they have a point of view. Now, if, if you, uh, obviously, I have, I mean, in my selection for a presentation, there's, pers there's perspective and point of view in this, in, in just in terms of what I have to winnow down to, in order for the presentation to be coherent, to, to fit into a, a time frame. So yeah, there's, we, we have to make arguments so that we can share those arguments and come to some better understanding about knowledge and, and who we are. On behalf of Osher, Professor, I'd like to thank you very much for coming. And <laughs> And, and by and large, I'm pleased with you guys. So thank you very much.